Tell me again, amen? Right. And until that time, we would be carrying out the Great Commission. Right. Amen, brother? Amen. So what a blessing it's been to have Brother Kastner with us, to have good, sound, confrontational Bible preaching, which is what Bible preaching does. Give us a reminder, convict us where we fall short, confront us on how we can do better for our Lord. Amen? Amen. Brother Kastner, let's keep it going. Come Amen. preach the word. Thank you, brother. Amen. Good evening. Wow, we're going to have to pray him in tonight. Amen? Acts 13, they're coming in. Praise the Lord. Acts 13. It's been a good week, and we're thankful to the Lord for everything that he is doing. And uh, I appreciate all your prayers. I appreciate your hospitality. I appreciate uh, coming out and supporting the meeting, both in prayer and also in your, in your presence here, being faithful to the Lord. And I know God will honor that. God will bless you. God will bless this church. Amen? And that's what we're here for. So we're going to uh, stand tonight. We're going to begin in Acts chapter 13. And I want to preach about the value of local church missionaries. The value of local church missionaries. You do have a handout that will serve just as a um, kind of illustrative point. I'm not going to preach that outline per se on mission boards, but I want you to have that and consider some of the important points. Verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them. They sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Let's pray. Fathers, we bow before you tonight. We want to thank you so much that we can dedicate this week to the theme of missions. Father, we know it's the heartbeat of the church, the Great Commission. Father, we thank you for what you're teaching us through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God. And tonight, Lord, I ask that you would use me as your instrument, that you would fill me with thy spirit, Father, that the things that I uh, speak will be the words of God and led by the Spirit of God, even the preaching, Father, the exhortation, that it would be encouraging, that it would be challenging. But, Father, our goal this week is to edify the church. Also, Lord, the challenge and see the lost saved in our midst. So, Father, we need you. We need your leadership every service, every moment of every service. And, Father, we know a lot of prayer has gone into this week and a lot of work, a lot of time, sacrifice and preparation. And Father, we ask you to bless those that are, are tired and maybe, Father, are stretching themselves. I pray that this week will be a time of growth, spiritual growth for all of us. Father, we need to grow. We need to be challenged. We need to go forward in our Christian lives. And I pray that this week, Father, we would see laborers called out of this church, sent forth more laborers, more preachers, more missionaries. Father, we know that you call, you say, separate unto me for the work that I've called them to. And we ask you to do that in Long Island Baptist Church. We ask you to do it in Heritage Baptist Church. Father, that we could see a greater work, that you would give us a greater vision, that we would have 
Father, greater uh, outreach and uh, an impact in this world. Father, we know we can do more for you. And we just ask you, Father, that we would be willing to sacrifice. Father, speak to us tonight. Teach us about local church missions from a practical standpoint, Lord, and all the blessings and benefits and all that you do as we are obedient to the Great Commission. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Boy, I better pray some more. Maybe we better pray another 10 minutes and then we'll get more people in. Amen. Well, thank you for coming out. I know it's a long work week. And I appreciate you sacrificing. I, I can't even imagine. I just drove out here one, you know, one day and I was like stressed out. So you, you do that every day. Amen. So I appreciate that. Well, Houston's about the same, believe it or not. It's crazy in Houston, so we, uh, we're prepared, amen, for the battle. <laughs> Acts 13, as you know, what a great text, what a great church, what a great example here, setting a pattern for New Testament missions. And we are of the conviction, and I know some, maybe we have some new brethren here, some new members, some that are coming into the church and probably have never even met some of the missionaries I've named or talk about and preachers that are already on with the Lord. Uh, some of the fellowship we had today, we were talking about that. You know, some of us uh, knew the men of God that fought the battles, you know, the last 50 to 75 years and they were very godly men that were sold out for Christ and they preached sound doctrine and, and were strong independent Baptists and sound on, on doctrine and of the church and on missions. They were very missions minded. And you don't, you probably won't meet them, but I believe that I am a connection to the past. Because they were my mentors. They were the ones who trained me. They imparted their faith, their doctrine. And now it is my responsibility to pass that on, that heritage. And you're not going to have uh, missionaries through here or, or even pastors, you know. And, I, and uh, I do appreciate that. Don't get me wrong. I think a pastor... A lot of churches have pastors come in and preach missions conferences, and I think they can do a great job. Amen. I, I are one now. Amen. But from the other experience of being a missionary for about 30 years, I think you add to it. You know, that experience and that maybe from both sides, you know, from a pastor's heart, and also from a missionary's heart. And, uh, you know, sometimes there are pastors in churches that they don't think missionaries can preach, you know, so they don't want to give them, you know, that maybe they just don't think they're polished enough or uh, up on it, uh, up, you know, up to, up to it or up to the calling. <laughs> and I've been in a lot of churches like that. Hey, brother, you know, you just show us your slides, you know. And uh, things like that, and, and I, it, it kind of, you know, burdened my heart. I mean, God called, you know, first he calls you to preach. You know, that's a calling. And missionaries better be able to preach, amen. There was one pastor, and they took us on. He said, brother, I want you to come in here and preach the gospel. I want you to preach to our people what you are going to preach on the mission field. And we want to know the gospel you preach. And that was good counsel, amen. So I got to preach the gospel, amen, and they took us on. So uh, I don't know where I'm going with that, but anyway, you heard it. Making that connection to the past. That's where I'm going with it. And the truth is, how are you going to know? You know, there's materials that have been written. 
And now they're no longer in existence. Those pastors have passed on. Those churches have just kind of left off that printing ministry. Those materials are no longer even available. And so we have this burden. And I'm just thinking, you know, Lord, how can we encourage churches today to really take a strong stand in doctrine and practice, but also have this conviction that we need to be missions minded, that we, we need to really fulfill the Great Commission. This is God's calling and, and we need to do it the best way. We need to do it the scriptural way. We need to honor the Lord in every way. So if we don't have those convictions, brethren, we don't have that understanding, then we're definitely not going to do what God called us to do. We're going to miss it. We know that mission boards, we see here in the text, it was in the church, amen? It was in the church. It was through the church. And this is the New Testament pattern of doing mission work. It was always done through local, independent, autonomous Baptist churches. New Testament Baptist churches. You know why I know that? There were no other institutions. There was only the church. Amen. Amen. And uh, that was the only institution. We talked about how modern mission boards were established by the British Parliament and by, uh, you know, William Carey and modern missionary and so on and so forth. And, and uh, really it was because the churches decided they just left off the Great Commission. Isn't that sad? So basically they said, well, we better do it this way then. Let's think of other ways we can send out this missionary. Isn't that sad when the churches have failed to take up their responsibility, their God-given responsibility, their God-given authority, their God-given mandate. And now other institutions think, well, we got to do the job. The churches are failing. Well, we don't want to fail, amen? God didn't, God didn't, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't start the church to fail, amen? He started the church to succeed. And fulfill the calling. So we see here, this is the church, this is the place of missionary service. It's the place where God proves the missionaries, God prepares the missionaries. It's the place that we send out the missionaries, we support them, and we sustain them in so many ways. And that, that's kind of where we're heading tonight with the message. And... Let's go to chapter 14, just a few pages over, verse 26. These missionaries also understood their relationship to their home church. It says in chapter 14, now this is after, at the end of the first missionary journey, it says, and thence they sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. Amen. They knew what the work was, that God called them unto the work, and you can study that, uh, Acts 13 and 14, and I may mention a few things tonight, but what is the work of missions? It's right there in those chapters. They, they did establish churches. They did ordain elders in every church. I mean, they did the work of mission. They fulfilled the work, amen? amen? And then they came back to their home church. Do you see that? Verse 27, when they were come, they gathered the church together and they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of the faith of the Gentiles and there they abode long time with the disciples, amen? There was that renewal, there was that uh, reconnection back to the home church. They abode a long time there. It was necessary before they were in commend, and, and, uh, uh, recommended again. I was going to say encomendado. 
Amen. They were recommended again under the grace of God. And so they reported. And really they went around. If you, This is amazing. You say, well, furlough and yeah, furlough. They, they, and then they went to the other churches and reported what God did. It's right in the Bible, amen? Let's not complain about it. You know, furlough isn't easy, but it's necessary. It's necessary for the missionary, necessary for his family, and it's also necessary for the churches because the churches were edified when they heard the testimonies and they saw the work of God and, and it encouraged them to keep doing more for Christ, amen? amen? That's the purpose of deputation and furlough, amen? And so these men respected the authority. They recognized and respected the authority and the autonomy of the local church. This is something that is so necessary today to see because times have changed. Even among independent, so-called independent Baptists, you may not even find the name Baptist out there. In the next 50, 25 years, if the Lord tarries me, he's coming, praise God. I hope he comes soon, amen, listen for the trumpet. But if the Lord tarries, we need to be busy about the work. Occupy till I come, amen. He wants us to be found with faith, to be faithful unto the end. But there's so many parachurch organizations today. So many different mission boards. Let me just tell you, believe it or not, I was in a Bible college, Maranatha Baptist Bible College, back, I got out, I was saved in the Marine Corps, 1981, March 19th, someone knows that here, amen. And uh, that's 42 years ago. 42 years! Did I say that? That's a blessing, amen? That's a lifetime, and I got a whole nother lifetime to live, Lord willing, amen? It's going to be exciting. It's going to be amazing what's coming. Praise the Lord for that. And so, uh, in Bible college, it wasn't, it was a local church. They had sound doctrine. They had local church doctrine. But they had a change of presidents. We had a Myron Cedar home. He came out of the conservative Baptist. And, and you know, he, he, he believed in local church only. I have a lot of his booklets somewhere buried in the boxes. And uh, he believed in the King James Bible. So I think that's pretty good doctrine, amen? amen. Local church Baptist. We had uh, Dr. Richard Weeks, Baptist historian. And he taught church perpetuity. You know, when you look back, believe it or not, he had to have brain surgery, and I actually uh, had a tumor removed. I actually lived with him for a year and had access to his personal library in his house, amen? God is, uh, you know, you just see, and then, then we had a new president come in, Arno Q. Winnegar. And Winnegar, you know, changed. He wanted to change the doctrine. And then they start bringing in professors, you know, from Bob Jones and doctors, and, and they bring in this doctrine, all this false doctrine. So you got these old timers holding on, and I mean, there was debates going on and schisms. And uh, one of the problems is it wasn't, under, it wasn't under a local church. That tells you the problem, amen. But anyway, God allowed me to go there. It was, that's another long story, but I, I was able to go there and because of the church I was saved in. Some of you may, not, you, some of you may have heard of Tim Anger, uh, administrator of uh, the school down at Lehigh Valley. God just miraculously saved his life over a year ago. His dad was my first pastor, Alan Anger. When I was saved in the military, he became my first pastor and great man of God, and he's still alive and still preaching, amen, amazing, and, uh, but there, you know, he had that burden, if you're called to preach, 
you know, basically the idea is you should go prepare. Prepare to preach. And that was what I learned. And I was in a, had a pastor over us in the military. He was from Maranatha. And then Tim Anger was from Maranatha. And then uh, some other school teachers they had over there were from Maranatha. And then I traveled overseas and I met some missionaries from Maranatha. And I, I started saying, well, maybe I better go to Maranatha. So I went to Maranatha. Right or wrong, that's where I ended up. And God used it in my life for many things. Amen. My wife was there. Amen. I met her and got married in 1988 after we graduated. And she was a member of Doug Hammett's church out in Illinois, Mazan Baptist Church. And so I got to meet Brother Hammett because he wanted to meet me. Interested in one of the young ladies of his church. So I went out there to preach for the first time in 1987. Met Brother Hammett. And we began talking about missions because... And am I still telling that same story? Yeah, I am. Okay. Believe it or not, I came to the conviction at this college because of the professors I had, they would present, okay, you can go to the mission field. I already believe God was calling me to missions. You could go through a mission board. You can go through a mission agency, kind of a more... Uh, control, a little less control, or a clearinghouse type thing, and then, or the local church. So they did present that. Well, reading the Bible, I just believed God was going to send me out of the local church. That's what they did in Acts 13. That's what I need to do, amen? amen? But the sad thing is, they didn't really promote that. They had all these representatives come through from mission boards, you know, Baptist World Missions, and all these different mission boards come through here and they try to recruit you to go out. Well, I didn't believe that. And then the summer of 1987, I came out here to Pennsylvania where I grew up anyway, east in Pennsylvania. And I went to seminary and Land I went to uh, be a preacher boy at Calvary Baptist Church Lansdale under E. Robert Jordan, chief. And we kind of hit it off. That's in 87. And I just was, you know, trying to prepare for the ministry. I thought, okay, maybe God will have me come out to this seminary. Well, in the meantime, Doug Hammett, God called him to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church from Mazan Baptist Church. God called Tim Reynolds to uh, Mazan Baptist Church. And then we got married in Mazan, and we already agreed to come work out here at Lehigh Valley under Brother Hammett and eventually be sent to the mission field. Well, in the meantime, E. Robert Jordan, he didn't like Doug Hammett. He's a Baptist brider. You know, only Baptists go to heaven, and he's a Ruckmanite, and you know, all this stuff. And the amazing thing is, I went to his home, and I just asked him, I, I, believe it or not, I was just ignorant, young preacher, and I literally took an ordination questionnaire, sat down with Doug Hammond, I'm like, going through that, and he just answered all every question, you know, patiently, just out with me and answered every question and and so I knew what he believed he said you're wrong Dr. Jordan well if you go to Lehigh Valley Baptist Church you cannot come to seminary and so I was put in that position as a young man make a choice what are you going to do you're going to believe the word of God? You're going to follow your convictions? Or are you going to follow the path? I, I had a lot of friends go to that seminary, and they, they're washed out. They're not even in the ministry. And uh, I thank the Lord that when I, I look back and I said, I was rejoicing. God already, I didn't even know how I was going to go to the mission field. I already had the conviction. And when I went to meet Brother Hammond in 1987, he said, Brother, there's churches all over America that believe that, that we should be sending out missionaries through the local church. And I'm like, really? Because I never heard it at Bible college. 
And I was excited. And, you know, God answered my prayer. And I came out to Lehigh Valley and I just trusted the Lord. And I said, you know, I'll just do everything I can to train right here. Learn more under my pastor, under my church. And that's what we set out to do. Amen. And I look back at that as a a turning point in our lives and in our ministry based on the word of God, based on convictions that we need to be sent out of the local church and that we need missionaries that have that same conviction. We need churches all over America that still follow God's New Testament pattern. So I want you to see tonight some of the blessings and some of the benefits. First of all, I want you to see the value of a missionary to his church. The value of a missionary to his church. Do you realize it's a privilege as a church to send out missionaries? It's a blessing. Not all churches have missionaries they're sending out. And we ought to, I mean, I, I look at heritage and I'm like, Lord, I mean, I'm, you know, I love missions and we want to send out missionaries. But now I just have to wait on the Lord. I have to preach and prepare the church and trust God. But that's our heart. First of all, and, and we don't have to spend a lot of time because as someone has mentioned, we build each night. Some of these principles I've already uh, preached here, so I'll just go over and remind them. Number one, the blessing is this. The church, the value of the missionary to his church, the church becomes an obedient church. Amen? Amen. When you have a missionary and you're sending out a missionary, you are doing what Jesus called you to do. What a blessing. You're fulfilling Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You're fulfilling Acts 1, 8. So God is blessing you as a church. Go to Mark chapter number 3. We see this pattern from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is nothing new. Amen. We know that God gives us convictions based on the word of God. God gives us uh, instructions and it says in Acts 3 or Mark 3 14 and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Amen. Amen. Jesus established the pattern in his when he established the church. Look at Luke chapter 10 verse number 1. This is the 70 now. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every place whither he himself would come. Amen. Jesus sent out the 12. Jesus sent out the 70. He established the pattern in the church. And then we go to Acts Chapter 8, remember we have a pattern in the Bible. Acts chapter 8, we see movement sent out of the Jerusalem church. The church that Jesus established. The pattern that he said, and now we have James, the pastor. And it says in uh, Acts 8 and verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And then we go down to verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Amen. And then we go to verse number 25. And, when, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel. Now look at this. In many villages of the Samaritans. Amen. 
And then we see how God led Philip in verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So the Lord sending him. And then in verse 40. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Do you see, brethren, there is a pattern that's very clear. The Lord established the church. The Lord ordained the church. The Lord commissioned the church. And now we see the church being obedient under James. And then we, we do know that Peter, chapter 9, in verse 32, what did Peter do? And it came to pass, Peter passed throughout all quarters. He came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And so we see Peter, look at verse number 38. And, uh, and for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And then uh, we see in chapter 10, we, we see the work that God did in the house in Caesarea, uh, in the house of Cornelius, and how the gospel was preached there and Cornelius was saved. And then go to chapter 11 in verse 22. So we're still looking at the church in Jerusalem. You see all the activity. You see the men they were sending all throughout these villages, all throughout these cities. They were going everywhere preaching the gospel. And they understood that they were starting churches, brethren. This is an amazing movement of God. And then we see here in Acts chapter 11, we are picking up a little bit about our context coming into uh, Antioch in verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth uh, Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. And then verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek uh, for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass. Now, what did they do in Antioch? Look what it says here. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Amen. They established a church. This is what missions is all about. And taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And then they were given responsibilities. We know they were uh, proven men in the church, Barnabas and Saul. It wasn't just like, okay, Acts chapter 9, uh, Saul is saved and he surrendered to the ministry. God reveals him, you're called. I'm going to make you a vessel. Uh, uh, you're going to suffer for me. And, uh, you know, you're going to take the gospel of the Gentiles. You're going to... You're going to preach before kings, okay, and then the next week he's out doing it. No, it wasn't. It's approximately 11 years. There's a time of preparation for the work. And I know we would just love to say, I'm called to preach and bless God, send me out. No, there's a lot of preparation. To ask. You need to be approved servant of the Lord, approved in the church. Confirm the calling of God on your life. And I'm not advocating, you know, just send them out, amen. God will take care of them. No, we need to follow the scriptural patterns. God has a, a plan for us. God will give us wisdom here. And so we know the time that Paul and Barnabas sent, they fulfilled this ministry. Remember, they had to carry the offerings and... And they, they had to, uh, verse 30 says, which also they did, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And we know that they came back, amen? 
Uh, one good thing, uh, look at chapter 12 right before our text in verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had what? Fulfilled their ministry. You want to serve God? You have to serve God right here in the local church. You have to serve God and have a ministry right here. And you need to fulfill your ministry before you can be sent out to do the calling of God. So if you believe you're called, what ministry are you involved in? What are you doing in this church? Amen. They fulfilled their ministry. They took and they and took with them John, whose surname was Mark, and we know a little bit about all that. But then that introduces us to chapter 13. Brethren, you become an obedient church. This is what God wants us to be. The blessing, you, you, you pray for labors. You pray for God to raise up missionaries. He gives you missionaries. You are an obedient church, and you should take comfort in that. And you should really rejoice that God counted you worthy. Amen. Amen. But then you become, a second blessing, a praying church. You see, missions... Rightly conducted is the greatest school of prayer. Remember Paul, and I'm not going to get into everything about prayer, but I want to give you a little bit here about these blessings that come. Remember Paul, as he went around, he established churches and he wrote uh, God, you know, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these epistles back to these churches. And what did Paul say? You know, let me just say this from a standpoint of a missionary. That when a missionary stands up here and says to you that the greatest support you can give me is prayer. They mean it. You're not a great church just because you send a monthly check. You're not a great church just because you have names on a board out here. You're a great church because you obey the Lord. You're a great church because you really pray for your missionary. Paul depended on the prayer of churches. He said to the Romans, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Prayer isn't easy. When, you, when you're so busy in life, what's the first thing that you drop off? Of your, of your priority list. How much time do you pray? Well, you know, I got so many needs in my life, I just get through my list and then I got to go to work. Or, you know, I get home, I'm so tired, and, you know, how can I really pray and intercede and strive together with me? Paul said to the Ephesians, praying always. I'll give you the references, Ref, uh, Romans 15, 30, Ephesians 6, 18 to 19. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He says to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, brethren, pray for us. He says again in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Listen, I said missions rightly conducted is the greatest school of prayer. Why? Because we need to strive 
to do the seemingly impossible for God through prayer. Why do, people, why do some churches turn to mission boards? One of the excuses is this, well, we can't do it. It's too much responsibility. Or we're just a small church. Do you know that sending out a missionary is possible for every church? If we are praying and we are obedient to the Lord. Do you know that through sending missionaries, look at Acts 13, our text. It says in verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Listen, brethren, how much time of prayer goes in to seek God's will. The pastor prays and he's seeking God's will. The church members pray. They're seeking God's will. The missionary prays and he's seeking God's will. How about... When you get the letters back, then you hear about the special needs, about the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions, the health, the material needs, the needs of the gospel, the needs of more laborers. You know, all of this drives us to our knees. It should drive us to our knees as a church. And when we are driven to our knees, then God is blessing us. Amen. You, then if you take on other missionaries, what do you do when you read their emails or prayer letters? Those that you've come to know and love over the years. Some of those letters become very personal. You take it personal. Wow. And then you go to the Lord in prayer because you know how much they, you love them, how much they mean to you. You see, when you have a missionary, you become an obedient church. You become a praying church, but also you become a giving church. Paul says to the Philippians, jump over there to Philippians chapter 4. And we know the blessings of giving, amen? And when you have a missionary that you're sending forth, there's going to be so many opportunities. Verses 17 and 18. Paul said, well, let's uh, look. In verse 15, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Amen. But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This is the blessing. When you get involved in missions through the church, the local church, Brethren, you have so many opportunities to give. Amen? It's like this Sunday, you have a great opportunity to get involved personally in missions through your local church by setting apart above the tithe a special offering called the Faith Promise Offering that you are setting aside every week or every month or every two weeks, however uh, you determine or I don't know, I don't have a card here. Well, let's say you do it monthly. And that's above the tithe. And you're trusting God. You're going to give that. You're going to pray about it, I hope. And you have been praying about it because it's something you need to trust God for. 
or it wouldn't be faith. <laughs> Amen? It's something you need to trust God for. It's something that God lays on your heart you're going to do for Him. It's above your tithe. But here's what you're recognizing. Look at the promises. Some people say, you know, God's going to supply all of our need. And they say that. But they don't know the context. No, this is a church sacrificing, giving the missions, and meeting the missionaries' needs. And God says, but, or Paul says, the promise of God, but my God shall supply your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. That's a promise. But what if you're not involved in that? And so you have two things that happen. First of all, you see that you are, uh, have a great responsibility in sending and carry, caring for your missionaries on the field. Brethren, we lived in countries we couldn't work there even if we wanted to. You have to go, you have to raise support, you have to trust God, and when you get there, you can't just go out and get a part-time job and meet the needs. You know, when you send uh, missionaries, there's such things as an emergency fund, as a vehicle fund, travel needs, special needs. And then when the missionary comes home, you have furlough. You have to consider housing, vehicles, sometimes even the simple things like clothing, food, supplying the needs of your missionary. Brethren, what does that do? That, that glorifies God. You just begin giving and you begin supplying all these needs for the missionaries. And God is glorified. And you as a church are growing in, in, in what the Lord wants you to do. I think another important thing here is you become, number four, a compassionate church. A compassionate church. Look at Colossians chapter 1, or chapter 12, verse 27. Think about when you start hearing about these needs and one of the messages that I do preach is you either are sending a missionary biblically from the body or you're severing them from the body. You're either an active sender or a passive sideliner. What do I mean by that? Do you think that the missionary when he's sent from this church is now no longer a member of the body? That you can treat them differently than everyone you see every Sunday? I'm telling you some things here that a lot of churches don't think about. And that one of the loneliest places for a missionary is on the mission field. And you know what the devil does? He amplifies. You are alone. No one loves you. No one cares for you. No one calls you. There's no one praying for you. Don't assume anything. Don't assume that they just know it. Don't assume that they just understand. 
because they're spiritual. Let me tell you what you should do. You should be calling them. You should be writing them. Letting them know how much you love them and how much you pray for them and how much you care for them. It says right here, brethren, in 27 and 28, Now ye are the body of Christ. And members in particular. And God hath set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. And that miracles, then gifts of healing, health, governments, diversities of tongues. And we know the spiritual gifts are gone. But look at verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body. But look at this. But that the members should have the same care one for another. Do you know that your missionary should know that you care for them just as much as you care for one another every Sunday? And I'm, I don't have all the answers. I'm just trying to tell you this is real. They should know that you care for them. You have to show that. You have to make sure. You know, one of the practical things is, and I don't know, I'm I'm just kind of giving ideas here. When they come home from the mission field, it should be a celebration. And you should... Put them down here, and you should all come and love on and say, welcome home. Welcome to back to your family, to the body. It's not easy when you come home and you feel like you're an outsider in your own church. Don't get so big that you forget about things that really matter. Things that make a difference. One thing, and I'm going to finish here. Not only will you think about the blessings you get, listen, to know the missionary, right? And then you get to know the people in foreign countries that they're working with. Amen. And you get to know some of the churches there and some of the brethren by name. Do you see how much you can grow in this? How much love, how much compassion that God will shed on you just for shedding, uh, sending a missionary. The other blessing you have is the understanding that God brings into your church. Really, the church starts thinking about things like indigenous missions principles. What is that all about? Or people groups and tribes and tongues, literature evangelism, printing of printing ministries, church planning. Do you see, the church begins to grow in understanding of the work of the Lord, all because you have a missionary. And then you become an involved church. You have the first-hand experience of experiencing and being involved in foreign missions. 
from the office work, the prayer letters, the mailings, the personal visits to the field, the trips, mission trips to the field, training others on the field, going there and preaching and teaching and training. Brethren, I'm telling you that there's value in sending church sent missionaries. It's a great blessing. It's a great benefit to churches. If we obey the Lord, amen. amen. Let's all stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, tonight we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in this service. Father, you know the needs of each one that's here tonight.